Okay, good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody. So I know I keep saying, hey, we're going to start First John soon, and I really mean it, <laughs> but just not this week, okay? <laughs> not to do it today. Um, actually, so we're still in the in the in between books messages, and um, today we're going to we're going to go with John, except we're not going to do the first letter. We're going to do John's Gospel. So everybody, take your Bibles, please, and turn to John's Gospel, chapter twenty-one. And uh, next week we're going to start the letter of 1 John. It'll be a great time. Um, but, you know, it's been interesting to me just how in these interim messages, this has been seeking the Lord. God, where do you want us to go? Where, do, where does the body need to hear? What do you want to tell us? And it seems like all of these messages lately have been really just matters of the heart. You know, um, not really heavy... I don't know how you say it, doctrine. I mean, everything that we study in God's Word is doctrine. That's teaching, right? Uh, theology, study of God. But he really has been just pinpointing matters of the heart. And, and if anybody says that God's not real, God doesn't exist, or God's not, he's not, he doesn't care about us, they're not looking or listening hard enough. Because we're going through a year, 2020, that we've, none of us have ever been through in our lives. And isn't it good of God to say, but I got something to say. I want to encourage you in the midst of that. And that's what he's been doing. And I think today is the same kind of message. Mm -hmm. Matters of the heart. John 21, brother. John chapter 21. Um, so, let, let, me, let me start off by saying this. Let's suppose that you were sitting down and you wanted to read the Gospel of John all the way through. And you did that and you got all the way through chapter 20 and verse 31. And that's where you stopped. And let's pretend for a moment that there was no John chapter 21, but you only had 20 chapters. Now, if that was the case, there would be a lot of uh, loose ends. Not maybe not a lot of loose ends, but some loose ends. Uh, among those loose ends would be, wait a minute, what about Peter? And I think if you know much about Peter, I can really relate. I don't mean that Peter. I mean the Apostle Peter, okay? Um, I guess I can relate to you too, brother. But um, Peter is often called the, the Apostle with the foot-shaped mouth. And the man put his foot in his mouth all the time. But if you think about just how, how he progressed in the Gospels, like in the Gospel of John, you know, he started out really well. And he said some stuff that you go, wow, that's, that's not from, from man, brother. That's, that's from God. And and, and he was a leader. He was really the leader of the gang, so to speak. You know, not, I mean, Jesus was a leader, but when it came to the guys, you know, they looked up to him. And, and then something happened about chapter 13, not about, in chapter 13, where Jesus is telling the fellas, hey guys, I got to go somewhere. And where I'm going, you can't, you can't come with me. And Peter doesn't like that. And Peter says, no, Lord, I, I want to go. He says, I'll die for you, Jesus. I'll die for you. And Jesus looks at him and says, Oh, Peter, not only are you going to not stand up for me and die for me, but you're actually going to deny me three separate times. And if you notice, if you read that in chapter 13, that's the last thing in chapter 13, Peter doesn't say a word for the rest of the time with Jesus in the upper room. Because I think it stunned him. Well, guess what happened in John 18? Exactly what Jesus said. Peter has the chance, the opportunity to stand up for his Lord, to tell people, You bet I'm with Jesus. I'll die for Jesus. And what happens? Three times, just like Jesus said, he denied him. And, and all the other Gospels talk about this, this event, you know, this, this denial. But uh, I believe it was Luke's account that said, after he did that the third time, um, so Jesus was in the courtyard of the, of the high priest, and he's getting, you know, tried, this unjust trial, and he's being abused and everything. But somehow he could see Peter, and when Peter uh, couldn't say for the third time, I know Jesus, and kind of acted really, you know, angry about it, I don't know the man. It says that Jesus looked at him, and that Peter's heart sank to the lowest it could go. And he went away weeping bitterly. There was a shame that overcame Peter in that moment that was overwhelming. You know, beloved, we all know that shame. We've all been there. We've all denied Jesus in our own way. We've all done things we shouldn't do. Things that hurt us. Things that hurt others. Things we, we, sh we, sh we think things we shouldn't think about God. We've all been in that place where we feel like we've hit rock bottom and and we just can't seem to, to do anything else but weep bitterly over it. It just overcomes us. You know what I'm talking about, right? Where it's not just shame, but it's the, the despair of shame. And we, we, we hate ourselves for it. And it takes us to bad places. Where's Jesus then? 
What do you feel like Jesus is there uh, then when, when you're in that kind of place? What, what about Peter? What happened to him? Because when chapter 20 ends, you know, you got Peter, um, you know, being with the rest of the fellows, inspecting the empty tomb, and then going to the house where Jesus pops in, you know, and says, hey, shalom, everybody. You got that, but you really don't have any closure until you get to chapter 21. And that's what we're going to see today. This wonderful uh, uh, passage, this wonderful chapter, really through verse 19, is, is Peter getting restored back to Jesus, a reconciliation, a repentance, and a reconciliation, and a forgiveness that is so beautiful. And I just think it's going to encourage all of us today. By the way, before we pray here, can I remind you of a verse? Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28. This is Jesus, and you can take this as Jesus speaking to you right now. He says, come to me, all who are tired and who carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. You know what the key to that is? Come to me. We've got to go to him. And every single time, he'll give us the rest our soul needs. Amen? Let's pray. God, what a treat, what a blessing that we get to study the, 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 these events, this narrative, this, this true story that unfolds in chapter 21 of John's Gospel. God, we get to hear it like it happened yesterday, like it's happening right now. We get to be transported back in time to see this, these events take place and these words and these things that you did. God, I, I love your word because it doesn't paint this picture, this false picture of superheroes. I mean, Lord Jesus, you, of course, stand out and you're perfect. And, but the people, the men and women that cover these pages, they're not. And, and Lord, we see the humanity here. We see the, the failures, the ups, the downs, the, the wickedness. We see the humility. We see all the things that we need to see because we so relate to these men and women who failed and who succeeded and then failed again. And God, we see from all that your faithfulness. We see that you are a rock and you're our foundation. You're the foundation of our faith and you're steady and you never change. But what's more, Lord, you never abandon us. You never say you failed too much, I'm, I'm done with you. You never say that. Other, other false gods that people worship, they, that's what the God they worship. Not you, the one true God. You never will do that to us. You'll never say, I'm done. I'm tired of you. Get away from me. In fact, there's never a moment that you're not there with us. So, Lord, as we look at these verses, I pray that you would encourage our hearts in a deep, profound way. Mm -hmm. All of us carry the baggage from the world and the weak, the, the, the baggage from the season that we're in. <sighs> God, I'm so thankful that you talked to us, and I pray that you would. From this pulpit, Holy Spirit, take it over. Move me aside, Lord, and you do the speaking today. And again, Lord, encourage us today. We need it, Lord. In Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. All right. So we have this narrative, very similar to the Old Testament, just the unfolding of these events. True story. Here's what happened. So we're just going to go through, pick out the, gonna mine out the gems as we go. Verse 1. Okay, so everybody in John 21, verse 1 here. Here we go. After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifested himself in this way. There's your thesis statement. Here's what's going to happen. Now, just, just to be sure that you know, um, after these things, he really is talking about the things that happened at the end of chapter 20. Got to remember, Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried. It was a really painful event for everybody who followed him. And after he was buried, three days, um, he leaves the tomb. He's risen. Praise God. He's gone, right? He's risen. And uh, the couple of ladies show up, and they're there to take care of the body. And lo and behold, he's not there. And an angel says, what are you doing looking for the, dead among, uh, the living among the dead? He's not here. So they run back and go tell the other guys who were, you know, everybody was trapped in this house. They trapped themselves in this house because they were scared. You know, they were afraid of what was going to happen to them after, you know, Jesus died, and after all, maybe the Romans will come after them. And Jesus, you know, kind of pops in and says, Hey, shalom, everybody. Peace be with you. So all of those things that happened in that home, and he did it twice because Thomas wasn't there the first time, so we had to talk to Thomas a little bit. And that's what it means by, after these things, Jesus manifested himself again. He just did it twice. But you've got to understand something. 
the disciples were, were in the dark as to what all was going on. They, they, they really didn't know what was happening here. All they knew was Jesus, they, they saw what they thought was Jesus, and they're pretty sure they believe it's Jesus. I mean, Thomas certainly does believe it's Jesus. Um, but they're not sure if he's going to come back again. They don't know if he's going to manifest himself again to them. They have no clue what's going on. And so here we have uh, these fellas, look at verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and then two others, two other unnamed disciples, were all together there at the Sea of Tiberias. Now, verse 3, this is actually a very significant statement. Doesn't seem that like it at the time, I mean at first, but listen to what it says. Simon Peter said to the fellows, you got seven guys, right? Peter and the other six guys. He said, he said to them, I'm going fishing. Alright. And then they said, we'll come with you. Now, this isn't uh, Peter just going, hey fellas, uh, you want to grab a couple of, couple of rods and, you know, go catch a few? It's not what this is about. There's a lot more to it than that. Let's put ourselves for a moment in Peter's shoes and, and these fellas, th their shoes. They just went through the most incredibly chaotic, confusing, painful ordeal of their lives. The man, the God-man, Jesus, who called them out of fishing, by the way, and we're going to see that in just a moment, called them out of that profession into a new profession, ministry, um, he'd been providing their every need for three and a half years. Everything that they ate, everywhere they went, every step they took, wherever they went, he was the one guiding them, and he was the one providing for them. And now, where's he at? They don't know. They don't know. Um, again, Jesus is providing for every one of their needs for three and a half years, and now, probably a little con concerned. And they're probably, obviously, a little confused. You know, what, what do we do now, man? I mean, we've got to eat, right? And I don't think there's any doubt that Peter is still reeling from his failure. Standing, you know, not standing up for, for his Lord. So no doubt, you've got Peter who's feeling sad. He's feeling, feeling pretty, you know, useless and discouraged and ashamed of himself. And, and uh, at the same time, it's Peter. So when have we ever known Peter to be patient? He's not known for his patience. He was a man of action. Um, pretty impulsive guy. So rather than sit around, Peter says, all right guys, look, uh, I don't know what's going on with Jesus, uh, but uh, we got to eat, and I know how to fish. And I think Peter is also taking you know, upon himself, I mean, he, he feels like these are his brothers, and he, he's, he's going to lead them, and he, he wants to make sure they're taken care of also. I think there's some nobility here as well for, on Peter's behalf. So that's why he says, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to that which I used to make my living, that which I know how to do. Hey, I know I'm not, I'm not a good Christian. I know I'm not a good follower of Christ. I'm a wretched man, but I know how to fish. Now here's the question. Um, well, before we get to that, actually, l let me show you something here, okay? Um, go back, if you would, to Luke chapter 5 for just a moment here. Okay, I want to show you something. Actually, and this is really important. I want to make a point here, but, but we've got to see this. And I, I want to put it right here, right now. It's not, it's not a surprise, of course, that they wanted to go fishing. Did you know that seven out of the twelve disciples were fishermen? Simple Galilean fishermen, okay? So, no surprise they wanted to go back to that if they have to take care of themselves. But I want you to see, in, in Luke chapter 5, I'm just going to comb through these, well, actually I'm just going to read the first 11 verses really quickly here. This is the moment when Jesus called these men to Himself and said, you're no longer fishers of fish, you're now fishers of souls. Okay? And it, there's a point to this, but just take a look at how Jesus did this, okay? So Luke 5, chapter 1. I mean, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 5, verse 1. Now it happened that while the crowd was pressing around Jesus and listening to the Word of God, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee. Okay? And Jesus saw two boats lying at the edge of the lake, but the fishermen had gotten out of them and were now washing their nets. So the scene is, he's at Galilee, the Sea of Galilee. He's got crowds around him. Jesus does, like always. He's preaching the Word of God. He looks over in the sea, and he sees these boats and these fishermen, and they're done. They're done for the day. They're washing their nets. That means 
Okay, we're done for the day. Verse 3, he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's boat, Simon Peter, and asked him to put out a little way from the, from the land, and he sat down and began teaching the people again um, from the boat. So you can imagine, now he has a pulpit, and the pulpit is Peter's boat. And he's just a little bit off the shore, and now he's, he continues to teach. Okay. Verse 4, when Jesus finished speaking, he said to Simon Peter, put out into the deep water now and let down your nets for a catch. Now remember, there's a crowd around here, so people can hear what Jesus is saying to Peter. And here's how Peter answered, verse 5, Master, we've, heard, worked, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing, but because of your instruction, I'll let down the nets. So that's Peter saying, really, dude? I mean, we've been fishing all night. You see, we, we, we haven't caught anything. We're tired. And I'm sure he looked at the crowd, not want to look like an idiot, you know, but, but okay, you know, you're Jesus and all, so I guess we'll do what you say. So they went out, um, cast their net. Verse 6, when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish, and their nets began to break. So they signaled to their, other, their partners in the other boat for them to come and help them, and they came and filled both the boats so that they were sinking. There's so many fish that Jesus put in that net that they had to get help, and both boats could barely uh, stay on the top of the water. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw that, he fell down at Jesus' feet, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And he's, he's thinking, you know, I just was telling Jesus, I, mean, I was just doubting him, you know. I was in frustrated with him. I was like, really? I don't want to do this. I mean, I know you're commanding me to do it, but come on. Okay, how many of us relate to that? Yeah. For amazement had seized Peter and all his companions because of the catch of the fish which had, uh, they had taken. Verse 10, And also there were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Don't fear. From now on you will be catchers of men, that is, uh, souls. And when they had brought their boats unto land, they left everything and followed him. Jesus literally says, Follow me. They left that behind and now they're going to follow Jesus. Now, go back to, verse, uh, to uh, John 21. Okay? Fast forward here. <coughs> Excuse me. What we're about to see is Jesus recreating that exact same scenario. Okay? He does the same thing. A little difference. There's only one boat instead of two. But he's basically going to create the same scenario that we just saw in Luke chapter 5. When he called them out of that profession. And he called them to be fishers of souls instead of fishers of, of, of fish. Um, they're, they're, they're trying though, remember, they, they're trying to go back to that profession. They were called out of it. Now they're back at it. And the question is, were, were they successful at it? Well, look at verse 3. Now we're back in John 21. and verse 3, it says, um, They went out and got into the boat, and that night they caught a ton of fish. Man, they were so successful at it. They were like, we're back, baby. We're going to have our fishing business back. No. They went out and they caught squat. Zero. They caught nothing. And I'm going to tell you something, gang. I think that was the moment that Peter had to hit rock bottom. That was the moment. If it wasn't already bad enough that Peter had abandoned his Lord, denied him, now he says, okay, well, I'm, I'm clearly not cut, up, cut out for ministry, and uh, you know, that's over. I mean, because I messed up too bad for that. But I can fish. And then he fishes. No fish. And I know what he's thinking. Don't you know what he's thinking? I can't even do this. I can't even do this right. <coughs> you know, um, I was thinking about this as I was preparing this message. And um, I don't know if you guys, a lot of you guys don't know, but um, uh, I was, you know, I've, I've been a pastor at previous churches. The church prior to this one um, in Greeley, <coughs> we were there for, bless you, we were there almost 11 years. And some of you, of course, were part of that. Um, but that was a church that closed down. And I got to tell you something, guys. Um, <laughs> I, I was asking myself, when's the lowest point of your life? And there was two separate incidents. The first one happened in the middle of that church's life that was really profoundly, really, really hard. 
Um, and I would say that at the moment, I would say that would have been the lowest point until about four or five years later, we had to close the church's doors. And, um, you know, I'm the only pastor that I know that's ever had to close a church. Now, I know there's been other pastors that have done that, but I don't know them. I know other pastors who, you know, been on death's door, you know, and, and they've, uh, they've, they've, man, they've eked by, and I know other pastors who've, who've reopened churches, and I know certainly other pastors who've, who've suffered uh, being pastors and everything, but I don't know anybody personally who's had to go through that. And do you know the shame that I felt? Guess who I blame that on? No, not, not David. <laughs> He was close, though, but <laughs> myself. And, you know, you go through that, and, um, and then, so here's what else happened. So I thought, well, I'm done with ministry. I mean, that's over. I preached my last sermon, shepherded my last soul. I guess I'll go back to music. I mean, I have a master's degree in music, so I guess I'll do that. Put my resume out. I'm going to start a private lesson studio. That's what I'll do. And guess, every time, guess what happened every time I tried to put the feelers out to be a musician? Zero. Nothing. Nothing. I know what rock bottom feels like. When you're entirely drained of self-assurance and self-power and self-effort, and feeling useful at all. I know what that feels like. That's how Peter felt right here. And guess when Jesus showed up? At that moment. Oh, that's our Lord. When we're at the end of ourselves, you know the irony? That's actually the point that we're ready to move forward. Because that's the only time we understand we got nothing to offer. But he's got everything to offer. That's the point where we understand our self-effort is worthless. So God's effort is everything, and it's everything we need. And that's when Jesus shows up for Peter right here. Look at this. Um, so, verse 4. When the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach Yet the disciples didn't know it was Jesus. That's pretty key. Verse 5, so Jesus said to them, Children, and that should have been a clue right there that it's Jesus, right? Children, you don't have any fish, do you? And they answered, No. And at first that might seem like Jesus is kind of being a little cruel, like rubbing it in. Hey, losers. No fish, huh? Yeah. But that's not what's going on here, okay? What's happening here is Jesus is asking the question so that they see the answer vividly. You didn't catch any fish. No, we, we didn't. So he's actually, he's going to show them this point here, gang. Jesus is going to show them, hey guys, I'm your provider. Now you're trying to provide for yourself again, and I'm not going to let you do that. Because I'm still your provider, and I always will be. Look at verse uh, 6. He said to them, Cast a net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. Does this sound familiar? It's kind of like Luke chapter 5, isn't it? So they cast it, and then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. There's so many fish that Jesus put in that net, they, can't, they could hardly reel it in. Guys, he's teaching them again. Look, I told you you're done fishing for fish. And here you are in that boat feeling all low and down. You think that when you were a professional fisherman that you were doing that in your own effort? You think your skill was what's filling those nets up back then? No. That was me too. And I'm showing you this vivid illustration right now that you are not your provider. You are not your own power source for living. That's me, Jesus speaking. And what an illustration to show us that. By the way, just a quick note. Every time I read this passage, I can't help but think about this. Do you notice that Jesus didn't stand on the beach and say, I command all thy fish in the sea to jump in the boats now. 
Right? You notice he didn't do that? Like back in Luke 5, he didn't um, want to show off for the crowd and stand up in the boat and say, here now are fish. Boom. Pop. There they are. Kind of like he did with the 5,000. Remember when he took the kids two fish and a few breadcrumbs and he fed the multitudes with that? He kind of multiplied it on the spot. Right? He could have done that here. He could have said, that would be kind of cool to look at too, right? All the fish get out of the sea, jump on the boat, already fried and cooked, ready to go. No. He said, okay, guys, I want you to cast out in the sea. Go ahead. Do that. Do that. Okay? Now, when you get out there, I want you to put the nets in the water, and then I want you to pull the net up. And this time it's, uh, hey, guys, you didn't catch any fish, so here's what I want you to do. My point is, is a lot of times people, we, uh, Christians, we in the church just think, hey, I'm just going to, you know, be, but bless me, Lord. Just bless me. Just bless me. Oh, I don't need to obey. I mean, I'm, we're way past obedience, right? No, no, no. God's just going to bless me. That's not how obedience works. God, Jesus, said, cast your net and pull it back. I'll take care of filling the net up. But I want you to do this. In other words, I want you to listen to my voice, and I want you to obey what I'm telling you to do. Because these guys could have said, I don't know who that guy is. We're not doing that. We've been fishing all night long. I'm not, we're not casting our net again. They could have said that. They could have done that. But they put their net in just like they were told. And guys, that's, that's obedience, see? Is when we, we hear the command of God to say, do this, our will submits to His will and we do it. And you know what happens when we do what God wants us to do or not do what, do what God doesn't want us to do? That's, that's where our will connects with His and He provides. Where God guides, He provides. Amen? Okay. A little side note there. Now, Jesus then um, cat, told him to cast their nets, and we got a whole bunch of fish in here. Um, there's one more thing we've got to address, though, and I think this is the rest, the rest of, the, of the chapter, for the most part, is what about Peter? This is great. Jesus provided all those fish again. He kind of mimicked the first time that he, these guys met him, and, they, and he called them out of fishing, and this is all great, but what about Peter? Because, see, Peter's still in that boat thinking, man, I'm a loser. I'm not worthy of anything. What about him? Well, let's take a look. Um, through verse 6, Peter is feeling the shame of his moral failure, his spiritual failure. Um, he's not providing for his buddies. He feels really bad about that. And now the stranger fills up the net. And again, pr probably feeling pretty useless. Um, Verse 7, therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's John, said to Peter, dude, it's the Lord. Okay, now I don't know why nobody else recognized him. Again, these are the disciples, and they kinda, they're kind of they in this sort of spiritual fog, I think. But John puts two and two together. Yeah, this looks awful familiar. This is like the time three and a half years ago when that happened in the Sea of Tiberias, right? And, uh, I'm, sea, I'm sorry, Sea of Galilee. And, and he put two and two together. He said, Peter, Peter, that's Jesus. Now, what did Peter do? It says that when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on because it was off. He was at work, right? He was working there, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in a little boat, and they were not far from the land, and one of, uh, about 100 yards away, dragging the, the boat full of fish, the net full of fish. Now, what happens here then, gang, is that Peter recognizes Jesus. Can you imagine what that must have felt like for Peter? Thinking that God had abandoned him, thinking that Jesus was fed up with him and done with him, not knowing when he's going to even see his Lord again, thinking he failed him. And all of a sudden, he shows up on the beach, and he puts two and two together in his mind. It's Jesus. Jesus just gave us all this, all this fish. And, and here's the thing. J Peter jumping into the water and going as fast as he can toward the Lord, you know what that's a brilliant, wonderful, beautiful picture of? Repentance. It's Peter going back to his Lord. It's Jesus uh, being available, but Peter is saying, listen, I'm a loser. I've done this. I can't even believe I did it. Every time I think about it, I'm sick to my stomach. But that's Jesus, and I need him, and all I want to do is get near to him. You know, we're at those moments where we feel ashamed. 
and we feel you know, a little mad at ourselves and upset with ourselves because we did that same thing over again and over and over again. We did it again. I did it again. I'm thinking it again. I'm feeling it again. Here I go. I, I just don't feel like I'm trusting God again. The evil one will whisper to you and say, you know, you really aren't that good a Christian, are you? And I don't know if God has any time for you because, you know, you've been doing this for like 70, 75 times. You know, the, the thing that we need the most when we're at the lowest point is to jump back in the sea and jump and swim all the way to Jesus as fast as we can. That's prodigal son stuff, guys. That's saying, I'm at the end of myself, but Lord, I need you, and I'm not ever going to let you go. It's a beautiful picture of repentance. God, I'm going to turn back to you. And, and that's what should happen. See, let me say this. If you're taking notes, write this down. The sin of our failures is never stronger than the love of our Lord. The sin, the shame, the wretchedness of our failures is never stronger than the love of our Lord. And when we fail, not only is Jesus on the seashore still, but you know what? He's got grace waiting for you every time. And He's got provision waiting for you every time. You know what's interesting is that here in this text, verse 9 says, When they got on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid out and fish placed on it with bread. And then in verse 12 it says, Jesus said, Hey, hey fellas, come on, let's have breakfast. And none of the disciples ventured to question who it is now, you know, saying, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and the fish likewise. So that means not only did Jesus fill their nets for the future, He had breakfast waiting for them for the present. And not only did He provide the meal that they needed, it says He fed it to them. Does this encourage your heart? What did Peter bring here? What did Peter bring to the breakfast table? Shame, doubt, resentment of himself, right? All those things that you feel. And that's what he brought to the table. Oh, but he did bring his repentance. He did bring his going back to Jesus. And what did Jesus have waiting for him? Everything Peter needed. And again, be showing Peter, I'm still your provider, and that's not going to change. And he knew what Peter needed now, more than he needed fish and breakfast, the rest of the verses, starting in verse 15, is really what Peter needed. Peter needed closure. Peter needed restoration. He needed to be reconciled once again to the Lord. And what happens is, and I'll just sort of summarize it for the sake of time, starting in verse 15, Jesus now has this one-on-one -on -one conversation with Peter. and He says, Peter, do you love me? And he asked that question three times. And he asked that question once for every time that Peter denied him. And the third time he asked the question, it says, verse 17, that Peter was grieved because he had to ask him the third time. Because he realized, oh, I know what's going on. He has to ask me this three times because I denied him three times. But every time when Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? You know what his answer was? He didn't hem and haw. He said, absolutely. Lord, you know I love you. Now, I know my actions and my, my failure and my sin. I know I didn't display that very well. I know that. But I'm telling you, Lord, I do love you. I love you with everything i got. And so Jesus says, okay, I hear that's true. Now here's what I want you to do with that love for me. I want you to use it on my people. I want you to shepherd my sheep. I want you to tend my lambs. I want you to take care of my children. That's Peter being forgiven and restored back to the calling that he, we see him given in Luke chapter 5. He restored him back to memory. And what's cool about it is, um, at the very end of this, when you, when you see in verse 19, when he says, now follow me, it's the same, it's, it's like Jesus started Peter's life all over again. He, he got a redo. He got a restart. The clean slate. You know, that's what forgiveness, that's how it works, gang. Whenever we sin for the umpteenth time and we go to Jesus, like 1 John 1, 9 tells us, and He's faithful, He's going to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. You know when that happens? The sin is gone. Clean slate. Clean, forgiven slate. And that's what happens for Peter. 
He restores him back, his spiritual health, his heart. You know, I believe with all my heart, guys, that, that these men, they, they took what, what Jesus did here for the second time, right? He did it initially, and then three and a half years later, here it is, um, he, he does it again. He shows them, hey guys, you know, you're going to cast the net, but the nets, they're not going to be full unless I fill them for you. And I think they knew, uh, even because, because Jesus replaced their, their, their fishing rod with the gospel. And he said, I want you men now to go out in the sea of souls, and I want you to, to, to cast the gospel out before men. But make no mistake, you're not going to catch even one soul without me doing it. And I think these men knew that. They took this illustration, this living illustration that Jesus gave them, and they knew that was the case. Do you think of Peter in Acts chapter 2? You know what I'm talking about? Acts chapter 2. They get the Spirit of God. He goes in his pulpit in front of the whole thousands of Jews at Pentecost. And he unashamed, fearlessly says, Hey gang, your Messiah was Jesus and you killed him. Now you want to kill me? Fine. Do what you want to me. But I'm telling you the truth. Fearless. Oh, and by the way, uh, at the end of this uh, the, this little passage here, um, Jesus tells Peter, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, that's crucifixion, and someone else will gird you and bring you where you don't wish to go. And it says, verse 19, this signifies the kind of death that Jesus would die to glorify God. You know that, that, uh, that bragging he did in chapter 13 of John, he says, I'll die for you, Jesus. It was almost like a dream for him. I, I want to die for the Lord. I want to lay my life down for him. And then when he got the chance the first time, he, 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 he got, you know, uh, cowardly and he backed down. You know, at the end of Peter's life, he didn't back down. And he actually laid his life down for Jesus. What was the difference? He had the Holy Spirit. And in Acts chapter 2, when he got on that pulpit and he told these people, you killed your Messiah, and they said, brother, what do we do? He tells them exactly what they need to do. You need to repent from your sin and turn to Christ and bow to Him and believe in Him, and you'll be saved. It was the first time that Peter cast the gospel out in the Sea of Souls. And you know how many, uh, how many souls he caught? 3,000. 3,000. That was the, the net was full, guys. The net was full. And every day after that, it says, the Lord was adding to their numbers those who were being saved. Amazing. Beloved, listen. I, I'm going to close here. I, I want to go back to that thing that Jesus said when he says, hey boys, uh, been fishing all night, huh? Trying to provide for yourselves again in your own strength, huh? How'd that work out? Maybe he's saying something similar to you and I today. You know, you've been trying real hard to fix things yourself, things yourself, right? Been trying to make everything, you know, go the way you want it to go in your own power. How's that working out? You've been trying to raise your kids, fix your marriage, fix your bank account, fix your circumstances, trying to take charge of your life, trying to make the you're, you're trying to make yourself your own provider. Are you finished? You done? Because I'm your provider. Jesus speaking. And I guess the question is, beloved, are we ready to jump back in the sea again and tear after Jesus? Because that's what we've got to do. You know, you don't have to have answers for your questions. You don't have to have solutions to your problems. What you've got to do is willingness to go back to the one being that has your absolute best in mind and heart all the time and who's got solutions to every one of your struggles. Amen. Amen. God, thank you for Peter's example to all of us. And Lord, I think sometimes we know what to think and we know what we should do. God, help us to actually do it and believe and trust enough to when we have nothing else, we've got you and we go back to you, Lord. Sometimes that's, that's the best we can do is to pray and say, God, I need your help. But I know, I, I know where I'm going and I know that you're my source and resource of help, all the help that I need. Lord, I pray for me, my brothers and sisters here. I pray for all of us, God. 
that when things get confusing and scary and sad and depressing and discouraging, the stuff we see in the world, the stuff we, the circumstances of life that happen in this dark planet, God, I, I pray, just remind us we got to go to the place we know that we're always going to be accepted and always provided for. Maybe not the way we expect, maybe not the way we want, but there's no question, there's never a time when you fail to provide for us exactly what we need. So I pray that we go there more, that we'd seek you more, and keep our eyes set on things above where Jesus is, not on the things that worry us, and the things that scare us, and the things that sadden us, confuse us. In Jesus' name, amen.